Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Mercer. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I direct our intestinal rehabilitation program. I'm one of the uh, transplant surgeons, but I must say I spend most of my life trying to avoid doing transplant surgery wherever is possible by helping short bowel patients to become TPN independent wherever they can. So they've asked me to give a little talk today on surgery and short bowel syndrome, and it should build off of the talk that you had from Adam. And so I won't go into too much detail about short bowel syndrome and what it is. And really, we'll talk more philosophically about surgery because in a short 10 minute talk, I can really just introduce the basics and some of the, some of the simple concepts. I just have a few disclosures. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly involved in all of the clinical trials in our field working on growth factors. None of the growth factors really have an impact on my talk today, but sometimes when I'm talking about things that get me excited and about where the future of the field is, I could allude to some of them. And so just to let you all know that that's the work that I'm doing. Okay, so I told you this was gonna be philosophy and that's what a lot of it is going to be. So here's, here's my first sort of philosophical point about surgery and how surgery relates to short bowel syndrome. So there's many different surgeons who are involved in the creation of patients with short bowel syndrome. But I would say there's very few people who should actually be involved in treating it. So what do I mean? Well, for anyone who's a patient out there watching this, you all would have had um, a surgeon, whether it was when you were a child or it's been a series of surgeries as you're an adult or perhaps some more singular catastrophic event that led to the loss of, of a lot of your absorptive surface. So that's going to be whatever surgeon happened to be around or was treating you at the time that the event occurred. For those of you that are medical professionals, these are well dispersed across the whole population. Now, the thing is the people that are forced to deal with these emergent situations or who are doing the different operations where, where um, perhaps bowel gets removed are not necessarily the same set of people who should be dealing with the consequences once the patients are already short. The surgery becomes pretty specialized and I can tell you one thing about surgeons being one is we kind of have sometimes the arrogance of the idea that we can really look after everything. And, you know, we all like to think that we're, we're good surgeons and we do good technical work, and I'm sure most of us do. But the issues that come in treating patients with short bowel are very, very specific, and the details really do matter. And I think that the surgeons need to be intimately involved with the team that are looking after you. In our program, I'm there with every patient along with my GI colleague. Um, it's going to be different in different places around the country, but what you really don't want is sort of the surgeon du jour, you know, somebody who just happens to be the person who's around that day, because while they may be able to perform the simple mechanics of the operation, they don't necessarily have the investment in the decision process that's involved in things. And I'll touch on that a little bit later on. This is a great big um, figure that I put together for a chapter uh, in, a, in a textbook. And, and most of it doesn't matter to any of you. I just wanted to make the simple point that if something happens and you lose absorptive surface, so that means a bunch of intestine gets lost. Well, what do you do? Initially, you stabilize that patient. You start the parenteral nutrition, start them on their TPN if that's what they need. And then you really wanna look and say, okay, are they truly short bowel? Did we lose quite a bit? Maybe we're at 50% where we should be or something like that. And what I'm gonna say is very simply, Almost every one of those patients should be considered for transfer to a specialized intestinal rehab center. Now, that doesn't mean everyone in the country has to come to Nebraska. That would be great. You're all welcome. But, but certainly, there's, there's centers of excellence in different spots around the country. Um, they are relatively few and far between in the adult population, a little more well-developed in the pediatric population. But I think this is really important. It doesn't mean that everything has to be done in, in, in a rehab center. It doesn't mean you have to give up a relationship with a surgeon who you really, really trust and you've been with for a long, long time, but you probably need a little bit of input. That person could end up doing your surgeries, but, but it helps to get some input from someone who's seeing a lot of volume, someone who's looking at all of these issues, especially as you get into the more esoteric and rare operations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I believe about surgery and things that I think are important. One of the most important things is early restoration of continuity. So what does that mean? Fancy words, it says, put everything back together again as soon as you can. Whatever you have on the inside, to the extent that it's possible, we should try to use that. We should try to use that to help you absorb calories, help you absorb fluid and electrolytes. So we're big believers in really aggressively trying to get back to the operating table. 
as quickly as we can and get on with things. Generally, I want to do that as soon as I think it's safe to do. So when patients are sent to us from other institutions, which is fairly common, I usually want to be around two to three months after the last time someone was in their belly. That lets the dust settle for us surgically, the adhesions settle down, the inflammation isn't so bad, and we can usually do things. Um, there are occasions when I'll push that back a little bit, but generally that two to three month range is about where I am with most of my patients. I can tell you guys, when, when I first started doing this, you know, um, gosh, 15 or 16 years ago, we weren't as good at managing, we didn't have the same technology we have to manage TPN. We didn't have some of the surgical tools that we have, and we didn't have growth factors. We didn't have a whole bunch of different things. And so we really had to get every bit of intestine. It was important to try to get that, you know, as much as we could. And while that is still important, I must say our ability to get patients off of TPN with shorter and shorter lengths of intestine has allowed us to have a little more freedom to say, gee, that piece of bowel isn't that good, and we're not going to use that. And instead, we're going to focus on this, this 60 centimeters of really good intestine. Because, you know, Almost every patient we've got who's got, you know, 40, 50, 60 centimeters of small intestine is going to ultimately come off of TPN. Depends a little bit on how much colon you have. But so it, it's just as the field has evolved, our, our, our decision making has, has evolved. My final point here is I, I believe in restoration of continuity. I believe in getting everything hooked up. But there are times when having an ostomy is your best option. And what this tends to, to be is if you're the circumstance of you're the patient who has fairly short, short bowel, and your bowel movements are so intrusive into your day that you just can't, um, you can't get out of the house, you can't get out of the bathroom. Sometimes you're better off having an ostomy as far along in the bowel as you can so that you can have the freedom to not be in the bathroom all the time, to not be having accidents, to be able to go and shop, um, go to a movie, go out for dinner. And, and so I think that's something that, again, you build up a relationship between a patient and a surgeon and a team and you talk about that for the individual. Now, here I've been talking to you about surgery, but this is probably the most important point as a surgeon, which is avoid surgery whenever you can. I always tell our patients the best surgery is no surgery. That's what you want if you can avoid it. So we try to do everything we can to not operate. And what does that mean? Well, we may want to change diet. You know, if you're an adult, we might, a lot of times people come to us and they're eating the wrong things. And we say, Here, here's the things that would be better for you to eat. We change your eating pattern. We're all used to eating three square meals a day. But if you have short bowel syndrome, three square meals a day isn't the best pattern for you. You should probably be grazing all day, eating six meals or seven meals, each one just a small little nibble. Nobody wants to spend, you know, 10 hours a day sitting at a table eating food. But, but you can um, have little snacks all over the place and, and just grab them here and there as you go. We may need, in some cases, things to make your intestines move better, in some cases, things to slow them down, so anti-motility agents. We may need antibiotics at times, although I would argue to most patients, if you're needing antibiotics to improve your function on the inside, there's often something that needs to be fixed. Because if our intestines are working forward and flushing forward the way they should naturally, Generally, you're going to be able to function without antibiotics. If you've been on antibiotics chronically and you stop them, you'll feel turbulent because all of your flora are jumping all over the place because you just removed the antibiotics. And people go, oh my gosh, I need them. I got to be back on them. And they become a little bit like a narcotic. You know, you have this antibiotic withdrawal. If you can just ride that out and get through a few weeks, it settles down and you can come off the antibiotics. And occasionally we need probiotics. But the point of this is, there are occasions when I see someone with a fistula where I know surgery has to be done right away, but where it's not so straightforward, I'll try to do everything else possible before we go to surgery. But sometimes you get stuck. Even the best of teams just get jammed up. So that's where you come in as a surgeon. So let's talk about some of the common, just again, large areas of things that might come up. The first picture represents obstructions and the second picture represents dilations. So obstructions, well, obstructions can be a little more common in the course of your short bowel syndrome, but they, believe it or not, bad obstructions that don't relieve tend to be more rare over time. Why is that? Well, the big obstructions where you have to go emergently to the operating room because something really bad has happened require usually the ability of things to twist or turn on the inside where they can get kinked and blocked completely. But as your bowel gets a little more adhesed on the inside, that freedom of movement is limited. So you might get 
of obstructive symptoms. And these are the kinds of obstructions where you get the crampy abdominal pain, stuff's not going through very well, you need a nasogastric tube, but it does tend to settle down. And 90% of the time, that's going to get better over time. And you want to avoid surgery because if you're going in to treat adhesions, we know those adhesions are going to come back. And so while sometimes you have to do that, and I've done that on many occasions, if you can avoid it, you want to avoid it. Now, dilation. Dilation is a phenomenon that occurs in short bowel patients where the bowel gets stretched up and it gets bigger. And we're not always sure why it occurs. It can occur because the bowel is blocked. But really what we're talking about here is dilation that occurs where there's not an obvious blockage. So when the bowel gets dilated, imagine a, you know, a, a thin tube that gets really, really stretched up. Well, that tube wants to squeeze forward and push food out, but it can't. It, 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 it squeezes, but the contractions don't allow for a propulsive motion. And so then there's a series of operations that we can do called enteroplasties that take advantage of the dilation to try to correct it and improve the way things work. This next image kind of shows you demonstrably what's the difference between if your bowel is dilated or not dilated. If you think about a big pipe and water is flowing through the big pipe, well, for all of the volume of water coming out of that pipe, a relatively small percentage of the water is touching the sides of the pipe. And touching the sides of the pipe is absorbing. So if it doesn't touch the sides, you can't absorb it. Most of it shoots through the middle and you have this big forceful uh, outflow of fluid, that's diarrhea. So that's your bowel movements and that's losing the, the calories that you need to, to, you know, to grow and develop or to stay healthy and come off TPN. If we can take that big tube and turn it into a smaller pipe, a much higher percentage of the fluid on the inside is touching the sides that you can absorb. And so your output goes down. And so a lot of the times that's our goal is to reduce the size down and restore that uh, volume to surface area ratio. One of the common ways we do this is an operation called a step procedure. So if you're dilated and you have this big dilated tube, we can use a stapling device that seals the bowel and splits it into a V, as you can see in the sort of the center image and then in the rightmost image. Um, and what that does is it takes this big dilated tube and it turns it into a much more narrow zigzag tube. And that restores the function beautifully. It actually alleviates most of the, uh, most of the dilation symptoms. This can be done fairly simply. Um, it is a, you know, it's, it's a fairly straightforward operation to do, but there's a lot of detail. And so to do it properly, you really need someone who's doing a lot of these. And I will tell you, it's a fair question to ask that surgeon if someone's telling you about this, well, you know, how many have you done? Because if they're telling you the truth, most of them have probably only done it once or twice. Whereas if you're in a big center, you're in a place like ours, you know, we've done it 150 times. And, and, and so you wanna to try to get to the centers where people have got more expertise in these things because the devil is in the details. This is an alternate way of approaching dilation. It tends to be used maybe sometimes more in adults or when, um, when patients have a longer length of intestine. It's called a longitudinal excisional tapering. So the idea here is if you have a great big tube of intestine, we can align those staples in a different direction, sort of parallel to the length of the bowel. And we can work along trimming the excess off and in fact, getting rid of the outside of the bowel and leaving us like in this picture here with a much more narrow tube of bowel that's restored down to its normal size. So now suddenly you go from big dilated intestine that, that isn't squeezing, gassy, miserable, bacterial overgrowth, all that kind of stuff to nice, small, narrow bowel that can squeeze beautifully. Now, when you do a tapering antroplasty like this, you can see that curtain of intestine on the outside that's all removed, and that's just gonna be discarded. So you have lost absorptive surface by doing this. But the reality is, if that surface wasn't really working for you in the first place, losing it doesn't really change very much for you. And in fact, when you do an operation like in the picture that you can see here, the fourth image, you end up with much better absorptive function even though you have less intestine. <clears throat> so, Coming towards the end of just this very brief introduction to the role of surgery, and, and I'll tell you, um, we'll have the question and answer session coming up, and that will give us a really good chance to go into specific issues with people. But I would say, from a patient perspective or the perspective of a team, when you're considering a short bowel patient, simplistically, I would say, if you're not moving forwards, then you're going backwards. What do I mean? Well, I mean that every time you I mean, every week, really, but every time you meet with your providers, and ideally much more frequently, you should be saying, what can I do to make my life just a little bit better? That could be a little less TPN volume, so I don't have to pee so much at night, or um, less frequent lab draws, 
maybe changing my hours because 14 hours intrudes on my day, but if I could get to 10 hours, I could do it while I'm sleeping and it would just be simpler. So, and, and, and then of course, trying to come down off of TPM. So trying to cut my calories, cut my volume, become more enterally independent. I would say from a patient perspective, if you're not making progress, if your needs aren't being addressed, if, if you're not doing something to make your life better each time, you're probably going backwards and you need to sit down with your team and you need to say, hey, yeah, what's going on? What's our goal? What are we trying to do here? Sometimes people can almost get forgotten about and you're just on TPN and you're used to it, the team's used to it, and suddenly three years has passed. And in some circumstances, that's not the end of the world. Maybe you just want to break. You don't want to be working on stuff all the time. But I think in the grand scheme of things, we really want to be looking at what can we do to make life better all the time. So I guess I like to think, and I, and I share with our team all the time, you know, guys, if we're not moving forwards, we're going backwards. So what are we going to do better? I believe in transferring early to specialized centers. I think you should, it's never going to hurt you to get more information. Anybody who doesn't want you to get another opinion, you have to really wonder about that person in the first place. Because I'm as specialized at this as anybody in the country. And if somebody said, look, I feel like we're struggling and I want to go see somebody else, I would immediately give them a list of 10 people who I trust, who I value their opinion. I'd say, look, let's go see what they got. Maybe they're thinking of something I'm not thinking of. But I think getting people involved in helping you is a really important part to your care. I believe in restoring continuity early, and we talked about that. I think you should avoid surgery whenever it's possible, but you should not hesitate when it's needed. And I do think sometimes surgeons who are frightened of the inside of an abdomen because it's hostile, will sometimes delay surgery. And I often get poor patients coming here with fistulas, for example, who've been you know, with this fistula for two or three years, sometimes in the hospital or long-term care because they can't get out and can't manage. And all they really needed was you know, sort of tightening up your belt, getting a little brave and fixing it. And, and so I think you can't hesitate when it's time to do something. And maybe experience in doing a lot of these cases helps you to not be hesitant. Knowing when or when not to operate is really the most important job of a surgeon. It's the technical elements are important, but it's the deciding up to when is the right time to do it. That's really the most important thing for the surgeon, for the patient, and for the ultimate success of that relationship. So everyone, that's the, that's the end of my introduction to the role of surgery in short bowel syndrome. Uh, thanks very much for your attention.